Hi everyone, welcome back. It's so nice to be outside. Migratory birds are slowly arriving here. The other day, brown thrushes stopped by for a quick snack under my bird feeders. And finally, after about four months of dancing around my bird feeders, evening grosbeaks decided to help themselves to some sunflower seeds. That was so worth the wait. Many of you probably know that we work closely with Wild Birds Unlimited stores. Their employees and their owners are so knowledgeable and so nice. Peter Anderson works in the Wild Birds Unlimited store that's located in Arlington, Virginia. And recently he's taken up a very interesting hobby, building birds' nests. Not for the birds to use you know, outside, but more for educational purposes. For the past few weekends, he's actually been giving presentations at the store. Peter has put together presentation for us so I'm gonna let you watch it in a second but if you have any questions or if you're curious to learn how to make birds nests yourself please feel free to reach out to Peter enjoy hi my name is Peter Anderson I'm an artist and naturalist based in the DC area I have a bit of an unusual hobby that I'd love to share with you I build replica bird nests from scratch come let me show you so how did this unusual hobby begin it all started when I was around the age of 12. I was reading a copy of a book titled The Race to Save the Lord God Bird by Philip Booz, an enlightening breakdown of the timeline of events that eventually led to the probable extinction of the ivory-billed woodpecker. In one section of the book, Booz gives an overview of the famous naturalist John James Audubon's interactions with the infamous bird. A brief description of Audubon's youth is given, describing him as having filled his room with nests and bird eggs. For some reason that line struck a chord with me. I wanted to do that too. I already possessed a deep interest in birds, however, and was keenly aware of how illegal, immoral, and unsanitary such an endeavor would prove to be. Not wanting to break any laws, or most of all harm any birds, I decided to do the next best thing, make my own. I picked up my copy of Peterson's Field Guide to Eastern Bird Nests, purchased some plastic eggs at the craft store, and began doing my best to replicate what I saw in the book, also doing as much research as I could online. The nest of each species of bird is every bit as unique as themselves. Perhaps this is why I find them so beautiful. The vast array of styles and materials that birds use, all held together through the miraculous prodding of beaks and kicking of feet. Perfect round cups holding the most precious of gems, eggs, the beginning of every bird. I have a strict code, I do not use any artificial adhesives in my work. I adhere to the methods and materials a given species of bird uses as closely as I possibly can. For example, robins always mix together mud and grass, and great crested flycatchers always add snakeskin to their nests. I poke, prod, and weave, press, shape, and shuffle, using my hands and a pair of tweezers to mimic the movements of beak and breast and of wing and claw, always striving for as authentic a look as possible. Each project usually takes a day or two to complete, depending on the size and habits of the subject species. Nests built inside of cavities, like those of chickadees and titmice, are relatively easy to make, taking less than an hour if the materials are all at hand. While those of open nesting species, like cardinals and blue jays, are much more involved and can take me significantly longer. I have encountered a special challenge in replicating the nests of species that use spider silk in their construction, like vireos, hummingbirds, and warblers. I use raw unspun silk from silkworms, dipping it in sugar water to help make it sticky. I have tried to use real spider silk and found it to be an unforgiving material, almost impossible for me to work with. I'm still not sure how the birds do it. New projects always provide new challenges and I'm constantly learning as I go along and continue to be inspired by these marvelous natural works of art. I hope that you are too. Thank you so much for joining me. If you'd like to follow my work, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under the handle Birdman Pete. Thank you so much. Michael Groves has a big blossoming cherry tree, but recently birds have been plucking the petals off the flowers, so he's wondering why they're doing it. Apparently, certain songbirds do eat the buds and blossoms of several fruit trees in the spring, mainly because they're highly nutritious. The flowers might even have more nutritional value than the buds. 
birds might also be going after the sweet taste of the blossoms caused by the nectar within some of them. These buds and blossoms usually become available in late winter as early as February when other natural foods are quite scarce. So the early birds that feast upon this food source gain an advantage over their competitors. It likely helps them survive the winter better and could possibly assist in putting them in a good nutritional state for breeding, although this has not yet been proven. It's not just cherry trees either. Other flowering trees and shrubs chosen include pear, apple, peach, crabapple, red maple, plum, and even forsythia. And it's not just one bird species that's discovered this food source. Cedar waxwings, American goldfinches, cardinals, blue jays, both purple and house finches, northern mockingbirds, and evening grosbeaks all relish these buds and blossoms. Is it bad for the trees? Well, according to the experts, the feeding birds act like a natural pruning service, generally taking the excess blooms. Some claim that purple finches help the tree to grow larger fruit by pruning the blossoms. In other words, if every blossom turned into a fruit, one would end up with an overabundance of fruit, which would have to be dealt with in any case. So less energy put into an excessive number of fruits should mean more energy going into the surviving fruits. And if it looks like the birds are just cutting off the blooms and discarding them to the ground, it could be that they're being selective and just eating those blossoms and buds that are the most nutritious in the same fashion that white-breasted nuthatches um, that prefer to eat sunflower seeds that offer the most nutrition. Or if it's the nectar they're looking for, they could be harvesting that food and discarding flowers. It's just a different way to enjoy the trees. And let's face it, our birds have to live too. Okay, I know that our show is all about birds, but this exciting new discovery in the amphibian world is just too juicy to pass up. And it does have a strong avian connection. It's a well-known fact that frogs all over the world are in trouble for various reasons, including loss of water habitat, fungal skin diseases caused by climate warming, and the pet trade. So we welcome the good news from a team of Australian scientists that they have recently discovered five new species of frogs in very wet mountain forest areas in Papua New Guinea. Naturally, frogs also have myriad enemies all wanting to make a meal out of them, and thus they have got to find ways of avoiding that fate. The tadpoles of one of the new frogs, Latoria nespella, hatch their eggs in rain-filled tree holes out of sight so they can at least develop into juvenile frogs. But what about after leaving the safety of the tree cavity, you ask? Well, these amazing little frogs have evolved a most unusual defensive mechanism that's unheard of anywhere else in the entire world of wildlife. They have actually evolved both color and patterning that closely resembles bird droppings, which are basically white with dark spots in the middle. To put it in the words of one of the scientists, it is a form of defensive masquerade. I mean, how hungry would a predator have to be to eat a frog that's covered in bird turd? And would they even be able to find them? I gotta wonder though, how in the world did this adaptation come about? Did they initially and purposely seek out birds to poop on them? Did the frogs living near a dense bird colony survive better than others that did not? Someone has simply got to do a study on that. No matter where you are in the world, if you see a barn owl, I'm sure you'll recognize it immediately. There are 28 subspecies of barn owl and all of them have that heart-shaped face. If you have a rodent issue, put up a barn owl box to attract a mating pair because they'll take care of all your rodents. Barn owls eat over 2,000 rodents per year. They are nocturnal birds, so you won't see them during the day unless you stay outside for about an hour after sunset. They have incredible hearing and they see really well at night. They can hear their prey under a layer of snow and under really thick vegetation. Besides rodents, they also help themselves to European starlings and red-winged blackbirds. Female barn owls are slightly larger than the males and they tend to have darker plumage and, and more markings. And then North American barn owls are larger and whiter than the European barn owls. Adult barn owls are rather loyal birds. You know, they're loyal to their partners, they're loyal to their nest sites. It's only the young and the immature barn owls that tend to spread out in search of new adventures. 
during their breeding season, some of them will go as far north as actually here in southern Quebec. They breed here, but they don't stick around here in the winter. It's too cold for them. Barn owls nest in cavities, in all sorts of cavities, and they do love human barns. They will even use them during the winter for roosting, hence their name, barn owls. They tend to have two broods per season, but in warmer climates, they breed all year around. So many pretty women on our May photo concerts. I hope you had a chance to look at all the pictures. Let's check out the top five. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. Well, it's nesting season. It's all about family. So June's theme is we are family. All right, everyone, time to say goodbye. Enjoy all the migratory birds, this beautiful weather. I'll catch you in two weeks.